and the life history of people is just clear. And I can say more to you. Please. Well, yeah, thank you, Alfonso. Thank you, Gerardo, for the presentation. Uh, yeah. Merci, David Eji. I'm glad to be part of the agenda. I will read because I have to say in five minutes what I usually say. Uh, I found interested that this session is called Experts. I was scared before to come, but after being the three outstanding speeches, that is endless. I am really wondering what I have to do here. I still have to say something now. Okay, this, I, uh, this, this stuff is called Onoidura Data and Onoidura Sorry, some field were reflections from 10 years ago, some of it is sorry. Which I wrote uh, so just to with uh, my colleague and co author Roberto Wenzel. We are part of the team in charge of the social mobility service uh, conducted by CIA, the Onoidura Data Cross Section Service that explores the difference between social economic status of individuals and their parents. At this point, we have two national service. 2006 to 2011, one metropolitan, Monterrey 2011, one regional in 2013, 12 coastal states, one state level that is running right now for 2015. But in the middle of the discussion, now to design the National Survey 2017 with my, our colleague here, uh, Ray Campos, and now we are in this conference have to listen and learn about the Indian Service. Some of the main results that we have learned is coming in our, uh, in our book, released next week. So, in what follows, I want to share briefly our discussions on loitering data and loitering service. Uh, when we were planning our 2011 national service in 2009, uh, we discussed extensively about the possibility of loitering serving a panel way versus loitering data cross section. But the research questions and the budget directed for us to make decisions on loitering data from a second cross section. From longitudinal data analysis, by using recall batteries, we know that mobility is very scarce in Mexico, mainly in the corners of the social economic distribution, that mobility levels are different for women and men, and that there are important differences in comparing urban versus non urban regions. Regions. Origin is outstandingly frequent equals to destination in Mexico. Longitudinal data are good enough if we want to diagnose, that diagnose how much mobility we have in general. We need longitudinal service if we are interested in more detailed analysis that the outstanding speakers said before. For instance, for instance, if we are interested in exploring in depth two rates of equal mobility and asking under which conditions certain people move like men or work to We visualize now two opportunities for the next generation of the MOBI service. First one is to extend them in time. Second one is to extend them in scope. The second one is to extend the sample size big enough to make them representative to the state level, which we are doing right now in Puebla. As for the first issue, broadly in time, let me share some comments. In the discussion section uh, of the 2011 Survey General Report, we discussed the need for reviewing in depth what is happening along this type of life. The education history is it is apparent that some children leave the school very early and then go back and then drop out and then become successful or not. The same, the same may be said for occupation or migration history. Longitudinal data dependent on recall are weak on details in comparison of longitudinal service to address those questions about this type of life. We need longitudinal service, but this discussion faces at least three issues rooted in groups and cancer from the team of the ESID each year. With adequate planning, multiple methods, and enough information, time, money, skill staff, perseverance, and so on, 90% to 100% location rates of panel participants are possible. We are wondering now if we have all those elements at hand. And we need information, time, money, skill, staff, and perseverance. And perseverance is the only thing that we have in hand right now. Again, <laughs> research is always about the body available. How many people, as well as their quality and experience, Particularly participate in a particular research design study depends on how much money you have in the pocket or your perspective of getting funds. You are listening to people. Which is depending on your experience of collecting funds, how many people and how skilled they are. Participate, participate in data gathering also depend on the budget of it. Uh, some months ago, we started with a small model tracking the 2011 survey. And we learned something key. 
Let me recall for once that Mexico is still involved in a kind of civil war. Tracking households door to door is extremely challenging in these conditions. We need people in any part of the research process, but due to the fact that we do, we do not have a lot of people involved in the logical land service, they now have running those in field work is still there. There we are. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to uh, sit here and integrate uh, a bit <laughs> because I really, um, in the next round, I just keep it. I, I would like you to, so at the moment, uh, we already kind of, in the first round, uh, it was more about what is being done. Okay, um, that's nice. We have the perspective today. Uh, there are some efforts. Uh, I, I would say the most important ones we just talked about, but I would really like to challenge you in the next five minutes to say, what is the limitations of what we got okay, and what uh, we would like to have? Because we have here in Mexico, and we need to convince them <laughs> to put their money, right? Uh, by the way, in Mexico, uh, uh, for, for my uh, international, uh, is ONS. Okay, so they got into the money. So, so this is this is not a place to say I have done this, I have done that. You know, we have learned the data. No, no. Let's challenge. What do we need? And uh, what is uh, not fantastic of what we have? Um, well, what do we need? I think I would start with, um, like you said before, maybe demographers have used uh, a lot of longitudinal data all over time. <laughs> but I think we need uh, to be more explicit of what, what we can do with this and to, to make uh, not only people in, in academic institutions, but also in government institutions to use them. Uh, we were talking about the NOI earlier. Uh, there you have a panel, and, and it's barely used as a panel. You, you use it like each trimester you give uh, unemployment rates or, or uh, labor income, something like that. Uh, and we really we're, we're not using the, the panel. I know you can you can follow uh, uh, the same household for five five quarters, right? Uh, because it's a twenty percent replacement. So, but uh, as I understand, that that twenty percent of households that, that are replaced are replaced with households with similar um, similar demographic and socioeconomic uh, characteristics. So you you can maybe work with that and try to make a synthetic panel for um, for, for for longer time. Uh, so first of all, to inform people in in, in every in every area that that it's uh, there there are uh, some panel uh, some longitudinal studies and surveys that can be used and should be used as well and on the other hand something that Rebecca was talking about earlier about um, administrative records I think it's it's really important to to uh, move forward to this because it's uh, it, it would uh, save us a lot of, of money and time if we could use all administrative records we have that are actually helpful because some of them aren't. Uh, and, and, and we could save a lot of, of money and time if we could cross information from, uh, let's say, uh, the CIFORE, which is uh, the, uh, where, where all the beneficiaries from social programs of CSLR with uh, some survey from INEHI and stuff like that. And that's it. So what was the question? <laughs> so, so the question is what topics we can do with what we have and why, 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 why if, if we have done some mirror work, why do we need another way to do that? So that's well, I can go back quickly to the example that, to make an analogy between the example that Rubalcaba talks about poverty. Like if you measure poverty in two cross-sectional times, 
the points in time, you will get, I don't know, I'm going to say something. I'm sorry you I pay attention, but I don't know, 10% of poverty. Okay? And then you measure in, in the next cross-section another 10% of poverty. And then you are assuming that nothing is happening, right? That uh, may, or maybe it's changing the town, etc. But the dynamics, I mean, he showed very well, the dynamics of poverty, the, the, the life experience of poverty is very different. And maybe you estimate the percentage of people who have ever been in, in poverty, then you get a 40%. So, and the same happens with sociodemographic, uh, um, I'm sorry, I had that right, uh, with sociodemographic uh, behavior. Like you can see, for example, how many persons are in cohabitation today and in the next census, although it will get answered in the census, by the way. Um, and then you will say, oh, cohabitation is not increasing. But it turns out that if you have a life history of a, marit or a marital history, you will see that at least 50% of young people right now is elderly cohabiting people. So we're not uh, we're, we're missing all the dynamics of the life life history of, of persons, right? And I go back, now that I have the microphone, I go back to the transition to adulthood problem, which is well, not problems, the study of transition to adulthood. And and we find by using other and comparing other to other surveys, so the National Survey of Youth, for example, is that when you ask people um, at, at what age do you leave, left the school, and then they give you, you know 15. And then you assume that the person has a preparatory or whatever is the equivalent, right? But with the, with the other, which uh, asks you the life history, every single year of your life, whether you are at school or not, then you find that we find out that at least 10% of, of young people have intermittent, intermittent like, uh, uh, school careers, even in secondary, even in, in high school. So that means that we are missing these dynamics of what happened. And I'm going to give you, I can give you many examples of what kind of, you know, kind of research we can do. But I'm going to give you, in one minute, I hope, um, an example of one that I really like a lot. And it's, it's not about demography, so don't worry. Um, it's, um, it's about grade retention and high school completion, completion in the US. It's with, done with data from the National Survey of Youth, that we didn't talk about it, but it's a, national, it's not, it's a survey that was taken in 19, 1979 in the US is a cohort of high school people who were followed through life. And now they are, they are um, um, interviewing the kids and the kids are already getting married. So you have a lot of research about intergenerational, intergenerational transmission or demographic behavior or social behavior. And well, with that survey, for example, um, this is the typical question. Kids that, that are retained in the school, that, that um, one who has retained la, la reprobación, uh, they, they are less likely to complete a uh, high school, okay? And then that's what the research says at the beginning. But then, because they have been um, following this, uh, the kids of these 1979 persons, um, they, they ask a lot of questions about not only the typical social democratic ones, of course, uh, education, occupation, income, etc. but they also ask a lot of things about cognitive abilities, a lot of things about uh, scores for exams, standardized exams, uh, a lot of things about uh, parent-child relationships in the household. Uh, of course, you have all the, all the information about uh, divorce, cohabitation, uh, remarriage for the parents, etc. So this study has found that, uh, yes, there is a, a correlation, okay, one minute. There is a, a correlation between uh, retain, being retained in elementary school and drop out from high school. But in, there is, obviously not everybody who has retained drops out of high school, right? So what's the variation? So the variation, for example, is that kids that have good relationships with the parents, then they are more likely to do well in the school. And it doesn't matter too much if they were retaining the school or not. This kind of stories we can't do because we don't have any information. I mean, the best you can do right now is with either we have a lot of things, but with the best you can do in other schools is like, what was your social status when you were 15? And then we're again going back to the past uh, staying in age 15, but we don't know what is happening. And all the studies uh, done in the US, or in many other countries, um, are showing that there is a lot of dynamic that has to be not only with the socioeconomic variables that we know, but also with cognitive, social, uh, social cultural, and, and, and bio, even biology markets, markets that are like following through time. So I don't know, I guess there's many, many things that we can do. Thank you, Julieta. Um, um, uh, Enrique, I'd like you to continue on the, on the question, but uh, I'd like to challenge uh, you to uh, 
going to topics that, for example, are uh, fundamental for the future of Mexico, like obesity. Uh, we don't have data for that. We don't have data for the weakness of that. That uh, policy relevant is not something like that. It would be important in terms of pensions, important in terms of you know the tax that we would we have available. Yes. Because you established the president, I uh, will go back to Spanish, right? <laughs> Una de, las, una de las cosas que, que hemos estado eh, viendo es que eh, la movilidad social es un indicador clave en el contexto socioeconómico actual porque el contrato social tendría que cumplirse, la igualdad de oportunidades tendría que cumplirse de manera funcional y la diferencia que tenemos entre algunas personas que se han esforzado, que tienen más talento y algunas personas que no. Dicho eso, eh, esto ¿cómo lo cómo típicamente lo, lo evaluamos? Bueno, lo que hacemos típicamente es evaluar carreras educa eh, perdón, historias educativas, evaluar historias eh, ocupacionales, evaluar historias de logro, socio, de logro económico, eh, y ver cómo esto se entrelaza entre sí y cuáles son los principales eh, drivers de, 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 todo, de todo eso. ¿no? Para eso, si bien es cierto que podemos recurrir, análisis, trans, eh, cross section como hasta ahora hemos hecho, podemos hacer eh, diseños, eh, ya, hablaban, ya hablaban aquí de salvo paneles, por ejemplo, con el trabajo de, de, de Campos y sus colegas. Eh, todo eso, eh, como ya también eh, Luis lo, lo dijo antes, es mucho más sólido y en realidad podemos hablar de relaciones causales, prácticamente sí, solo sí, tenemos eh, estudios eh, eh, longitudinales. Okay. Dicho eso, no sé si sea chamba de Inegi. Eh, si en algunos países eh, lo ha sido, por ejemplo, el caso de GSS, ¿no? en Estados Unidos, pero GSS tampoco es la herramienta más sólida en los Estados Unidos para analizar este tipo de, de, de temas. ¿no? Entonces, queremos todos que todos sea chamba de Inegi, este, pero no, no, no estoy seguro eh, que sí lo sea. ¿no? Es decir, Ahora, necesitamos eso para poder establecer no solamente, como usted decía, no solamente vía la recordación todas esas historias, sino tener información más fáctica que no dependa de ese esfuerzo de recordación si a los seis años salí de la escuela, no regresé, no por alguna razón, eh, sobre la, todas las hipótesis, por ejemplo, en términos educativos, sobre decisión y selección, eh, pueden ser probados siempre por muchas otras y podemos hacer eh, malabares eh, eh, estadísticos, econométricos, pero tanto, tan así como el rigor, este, el, 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 el rigor del diseño experimental, eh, la falta de diseño de control experimental no reemplaza, no reemplaza absolutamente eh, nada eh, en términos de la, la, el rigor de las técnicas econométricas, no reemplaza el control experimental, tampoco es fácil reemplazar el, el rigor de la, de la investigación de uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time to open for the public uh, some comments. There, there are uh, hands playing back, another hand here, another hand here, another hand here. Gracias, buenas tardes por su participación, de Quino Vargas, de la UNAM. Eh, me, eh, me congratulo, pues, de que finalmente Neji esté haciendo con este tipo y decide también de hacer este tipo de talleres eh, y, de, y de dar a conocer eh, la necesidad de hacer estudios longitudinales. En mi experiencia, después de haber trabajado 15 años con, con este tipo de herramientas, cuando llego a México me doy cuenta que todo es de sección cruzada. Y trato de escarbar por dónde puedo empezar una investigación. A mi experiencia eh, le ha pasado a otros colegas este, que llegan y, y quieren hacer investigación y sucede lo que sucede, que no podemos. Y la respuesta que nos da un estudio longitudinal es totalmente diferente de lo que nos da un estudio transversal. 
Y muchos de los, de los estudios que yo he, he estado organizando y que muchos de mis colegas mexicanos hemos visto, por ejemplo, estudiando la evolución de la pobreza, han sido reportes transversales, todos ellos, la mayoría de estos. ¿no? Claro que con la ENVIP como que nos da una estrategia, una visión diferente. Y la razón es que un estudio longitudinal da una respuesta distinta y más profunda que un estudio transversal. Entonces mi comentario es pues eh, eh, invitar a varios investigadores a que realmente pongan atención a este tipo de estudios que yo estoy de acuerdo con, con los panelistas, que no necesariamente el INEGI lo tiene que hacer, pero sí, este, como en muchas ocasiones yo he dicho en intervenciones previas al día de hoy, a Eduardo Sojo le he insistido en que debamos, debemos hacer más énfasis en estudios longitudinales. Gracias. Hola, eh, eh, Martín es un Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública. Eh, yo realmente eh, estoy de acuerdo con el comentario respecto a la importancia de este seminario, y, pero quisiera poner en el radar eh, el estudio de salud de las maestras del Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública, que iniciamos en 2008, tenemos 115 mil maestras, hemos seguido desde entonces, tenemos un seguimiento activo a por encima del 80%, un seguimiento pasivo arriba del 90%, eh, y es un esfuerzo que se ha hecho fuera del INEGI, ¿no? Quisiéramos poder hacer y, y, y trabajar con el INEGI porque sabemos que hay muchas herramientas de gran utilidad. Este, este estudio, y, eh, eh, lo refuerzo un poco la idea de que tenemos que tener estudios que nos permitan no solamente evaluar este, políticas públicas, sino diseñarlas. Entonces, nosotros estamos en la labor de generar información sobre factores de riesgo para eh, enfermedades, enfermedades crónicas. Ahora, en términos de una sugerencia de temas de relevancia eh, que se pueden estudiar, yo creo, importantemente en México, este, quiero hacer eco de eh, la presentación de Rubén Rubalcaba, eh, nosotros también en el Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública nos hemos empezado a interesar por el impacto de la violencia y de ambientes violentos en este, el desarrollo de enfermedades crónicas, no nada más de salud mental, sino diabetes y este, una cardiovascular e inclusive cáncer. Entonces, yo sí creo que en, en el país tenemos muchos recursos y hemos generado muchos datos. Es el momento en el que nos tenemos que sentar a colaborar y de forma creativa traer eh, y acercar todas estas fuentes de información. Yo quisiera traer otro, otra dimensión a esta discusión. Yo estoy en el Colegio de la Frontera Norte y una de las cosas que nos hemos dado cuenta en el Colegio de la Frontera Norte a lo largo de los 30 años de la institución una institución que tiene ocho sedes a lo largo de la frontera. Y es la necesidad también de hacer, pues, no solamente de innovar en las metodologías, como es este caso, con pues, estudios prospectivos, eh, con encuestas prospectivas, pero también de carácter regional. Porque si se quiere vincular esto con políticas públicas, el país tiene 32 estados y generalmente cuando yo veo estudios, eh, que vienen de cuestas nacionales como estas nacionales, hay muchas limitaciones para hacer análisis regional. Por lo tanto, dependiendo de cómo fue levantada la, la muestra, vamos a ver reflejado el monstruo de la Ciudad de México, de la zona metropolitana de la Ciudad de México, en términos de la identificación de elementos de contexto que pueden estar detrás de los fenómenos que estamos analizando. Entonces, yo invitaría a las instituciones, incluyendo no solamente el INEGI, sino los centros de investigación, de la necesidad también de pensar en, en estudios longitudinales, perdón, en encuestas longitudinales, pero también con carácter regional para si efectivamente quiere influirse en cuestiones de política pública. Um, Muy buenas 
Buenas tardes, este, yo vengo de la Secretaría de Salud, soy epidemiólogo y recientemente acudí a una reunión de investigadores en la Universidad de Oxford y en, en, en la que se conmemoraba el aniversario del nacimiento del doctor Richard Dory, que es uno de los, digamos, grandes santos de la epidemiología. El chiste es que yo creo que este, este, este estímulo que estamos presenta, se nos está presentando aquí es, es internacional, o sea, no, no solo es que en México tengamos que hacerlo, la verdad es que me di, me di cuenta, porque lo vi, que en la India, en China sobre todo, están iniciando una encuesta ahorita, una, un estudio prospectivo de un millón de personas. En Inglaterra tienen el Banco Cero Epidemiológico de medio millón de personas, el estudio Cadori también de China, y otros estudios de la India también muy notables. O sea, el resto del mundo está despertando la necesidad de los estudios de estos estudios. Yo creo que un, un punto muy importante a tocar es respecto a las dificultades que tenemos para contactar, él lo, lo señaló muy bien la doctora Wong, para contactar entre bases de datos. Lo, están haciendo, lo que están haciendo en otros lugares del mundo es utilizar programas heurísticos que toman bases, es, toman este, datos similares para ir acercando eh, de una manera más lógica los prospectos que se parecen unos a los otros entre distintas bases de datos. Al lograr esto, disminuyen mucho su trabajo de campo. Solamente se aplican a pequeñas cantidades de datos que solamente tienen que ser verificados en campo, no todos. Y este, otra cosa que me, me, me agrada, porque también como que volvió al tema, es que cuando yo empecé a hacer investigación en Cortes hace aproximadamente 12 años, o 18 años, perdón, lo que, lo que hacíamos es que preguntábamos un montón de cosas. Y cuando decíamos de sangre, decían, ¿para qué sangre? ¿Para qué? ¿Qué tienes todo? Y actualmente está volviéndose a poner en el... En el, en el en Pietro, en el escritorio, en la sangre y los, y los biológicos debido al proyecto del genoma humano. Entonces yo creo que, si bien ahorita se ha hablado mucho de demografía, en el términos de salud y por el gran problema de enfermedades crónicas no transmisibles que tenemos en México, creo que vale la pena considerar estos tres factores para, para, para el futuro. Uno, utilizar programas estadísticos. Dos, como dice el doctor Agomi, dijo muy bien, buscar la manera de que los siguientes eh, récords y registros que existan en, en, el, en este país traten de tener una identificación única, aunque creo que llegamos demasiado pronto, porque ahorita todos los que tienen cuerpo son niños. Y el problema es que está en los adultos, o sea, para nosotros los, los médicos. Y tercero, eh, nuevamente enfocarnos en los factores biológicos que antes eran así como, como que para qué. Y ahorita ya tienen una relevancia debido a las enormes diferencias genéticas que tenemos, incluso entre el, en, en, en un México mestizo. Muchas gracias. Uh, I think I'm gonna conclude. I just uh, want to put forward uh, an idea that probably we we discuss later on, but uh, I think also one thing that we need to discuss is uh, there are some studies uh, there is a lot of private data in it. And it needs to make, you know, it's public funds. It has to be public. Okay, so I would like to come back to this discussion later, but and we cannot advance without a protocol of we are investing in public data. It has to be public. Uh, so I'm going to close down here. Oh, you have a small one. Uh, just quickly on the, on, the, on the topic that if, if it's in Eji who needs to take the data, uh, of course not. If you have a, a very specific story that you want to uh, do, yes, it's not necessarily in Eji. But uh, uh, in Eji give us demographic surveys every five years now, and they're going to start giving us a new one, which I'm very excited about, the, the National Encuesta de Hogares. <laughs> Uh, and then and now we're going to have a uh, data on migration, fertility, mortality every two years. And I would love that instead of giving us that, you give us some longitudinal data. And and it has it has some has to be the the nicest story, uh, but just the basic demographics. We don't need more cross-sectional data on migration, and it's better to have a longitudinal data. 
And I think that it's time, we've been waiting for 40 years, so it's time for us to have longitudinalized data as part of the national um, what's it, uh, in, in, statistic of interest national. Why the data of interest national are not data? That's my question. Okay, uh, we've got uh, uh, comments. I will close down this uh, expert dialogue. Uh, we have a uh, food and then we we'll come back uh, 1415 uh, for the um, lecture of David Miller. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh,